<laughs> I'm Tom Chavez, and I'm an evangelist for Sosta Software. Uh, hopefully you've already seen us on the show floor. If not, come on by after this talk. Uh, this talk is not a commercial product talk. I'm not going to be talking about um, uh, how our tools fit in with Jenkins. Um, I do have just, actually I do have one slide about the company. Uh, but this is a talk, it's called, it's not con called continuous integration for nothing. And since this is a continuous integration show, uh, hopefully this is will be of interest for all of you. And we'll go ahead and get started since we have just 45 minutes to go. So uh, the agenda for today, like I said, a quick SOSTA introduction, uh, talk about the need for continuous and continuous across more than just um, continuous integration, continuous delivery, but also continuous testing and continuous performance testing. Um, the big three, and I'll define what the big three are a little bit later, and talking about CI with mobile and performance testing. Change this a little bit. It's coming in and out. So, and if anyone can't hear me, um, uh, just uh, let me know from raising your hand or so. So, uh, a little bit about Sosta. We're in the performance analytics space. Uh, our motto for the company is performance is everything. You'll see that across um, our uh, banner. Uh, we've been around since 2006, and we've uh, introduced uh, testing from the cloud in the time that we've uh, been around and introduced that product in 2008. Uh, we've performed 10 million tests from the cloud. Um, the sweet spot for us is testing against retail websites. Um, if you're a customer of a retail website, what do you hate on Black Friday? That site goes down and you can't do any purchases. And that's probably because there were so many people accessing it. Um, we're happy to work with customers who have any season, whether it's a retail season like Christmas or a tax filing season like April 15th here in the States or whatever your season is of, um, to make sure that your site is up for the number of users you expect and maybe the more than the users that are less than you expect. We also do performance measurement, and we've been measuring over 100 billion user experience performances uh, uh, measurements uh, in the three years we've had a product out in the market, and we just continue to measure uh, millions and millions of user experiences every day. That's something we show uh, on a globe in our booth. You'll see a spinning globe with uh, flashing lights on it, um, because our goal, again, is uh, in delivering performance to customers, not only that your site will perform when there's lots of users on it, but it will perform well for your users. So uh, performance is everything for us. Now, getting in, that was the introduction. We'll talk about the need for continuous. Well, we all are here for continuous, and continuous has many nouns that follow it, whether it's uh, a CI or CD. Um, what's not like to, to like about continuous? Uh, everything is moving faster these days, and um, uh, we all want uh, the latest software. We want to, our teams want us to be updating. They want testing to be happening further. That's enabled uh, by small batch sizes. When we're moving to a continuous model, we could move out of the mode of, of updating things every 18 months or every 12 months. Now we're bringing it down to updates every two weeks. Or even um, if you've turned, uh, let's see, how many of you have uh, in your, your iPhone or your Android phone have just turned on, always, up, always update the software in my phone because you don't like being nagged about the updates anymore. I've turned it on and I find I'm amazed every time I go into iTunes and see just how many updates are happening behind my back um, because somebody did a bug fix, somebody did a feature update, you know, things. I just get surprised when something comes out because we're now doing updates of, of smaller things and doing them more often. Version control. If we didn't have version control across our whole uh, space, we wouldn't be able to do this. In the old days, version control just meant source code. Now version control means um, everything from uh, the source code all the way up to the configuration, everything as code. Everything needs to be um, closely managed in a version control system. Uh, we've moved to Git. Everybody's moved, lots of people moved to Git. There's other uh, version control systems uh, out on the market. But we need to have things controlled so that we know the code we're building, how we're building it, for what environment, with what tests, even tests as code, um, et cetera, all the way through so that we can roll back if we need to. Uh, simple branching, if we, uh, that's uh, enabled by our version control system and it's now a part of just the way that we deploy. We branch on smaller pieces and we merge those pieces back into trunk um, uh, with a good pull request and a good review. Um, that makes our, our project much more manageable and gets us uh, the speed of delivery. And all of this, of course, is uh, enabled by automation. You heard of Jenkins show, Jenkins is our favorite tool for automating everything. Um, it, it, there are 10,000 plugins for Jenkins. We've got a plugin for Jenkins. Uh, it's easy to build plugins for Jenkins. Uh, it sure makes it, uh, uh, it seems it's the tool of choice. Uh, so um, it's, we 
love it. Uh, continuous feedback, here's one of the things that, that used to be broken down in the siloed world of teams, uh, development and testing and operations and deployment. Um, teams that didn't talk to each other very well in the past, uh, continuous feedback is a part of the CI system, whether it's uh, turn in my source code, did it build correctly? No, let me know quickly, fail the, fail the check-in. Did it uh, pass basic acceptance test? No, send it back. Did it pass uh, the nightly test? No, send it back. Did it pass the weekly test? No, send it back. And get the results back to the developer as quickly as possible so that bugs don't make it further in the pipeline. The farther they get to the customer, um, the more the cost is of fixing those bugs. If it makes it all the way out to the customer, there's definitely been a failure on the way. And that's part of the emphasis on working builds. Nobody gets to check in code that isn't going to keep the build running. So, And uh, consistent environments. If your, if your environments are uh, haphazardly made by manual processes and not by uh, uh, stored as code, then uh, you just don't know what you're testing on what environment. And uh, that inconsistency is going to cause problems all the way through. You won't know if something worked, if it really worked and will work for the customers, and if it, um, if it fails. Um, if the failure could be because of the code or because of the environment. So having everything consistent and as code uh, is going to enable uh, it uh, working. And developer, tester, collaboration. Um, testers used to be a separate team. Now developers and testers are working together often. Many agile teams have the testers right on the same team. And it's a lot, that type of collaboration where the, the silos are broken down and the communication is um, together is what uh, uh, enables this type of speedy delivery. So past the need for continuous, we all know about the need conti for continuous. Um, the big three, well, what is the big three? The big three has been missing in uh, what we've been focusing on. And if you, uh, there's a lots of uh, people who use the phrase uh, the big three, here's some uh, fun ones from the past. This goes way back to, uh, if you're a sports fan, uh, the first big three were uh, three key players on the Boston Celtics. Uh, or if you go back to uh, auto, make, auto market, big three are the Ford, GM, and Chrysler. Uh, if you follow the Warriors win this time, they got the big three here with uh, Curry Thompson and I forgot the last guy. But typically, uh, the, the, the big three are um, the silos of development, test, and deployment, or, or DevOps. Um, and the problem is not what, what's happening within the silos themselves. <coughs> development teams are great. They're writing great code. They've got consistent environments within their, within their world. Um, they, they're doing everything well, and they're doing things quickly. Um, testing has a, a, a testing role, and things are uh, things can uh, be very good within the testing group. And the people that, that they hand it off to for de deployment um, have things working well in their world. The problem is the connections between them. The connections are, have um, in the past have not been great, and that's what's been breaking down. And that's what the great thing about DevOps is: is improving the process of moving things from one to the next, breaking down the silos between them, and uh, speeding up the path at which things move through these silos. Now, of course, a, a typical siloed uh, organization has uh, their SDLC team, the Software Development Lifecycle Group, um, doing their application development. And these people, like I said, have their environment. Um, they work with a QA test organization. And um, separate from them would be a production team. And I'll say, boy, the colors on this monitor are not good. They look much more colorful on my side. So. Apologies that they're so dark. And, uh, but what the, the, the thing that can bring them all together is uh, performance engineering and, and a CI process across so that we improve the touch points, not just between uh, the development and the QA environment, and not just between uh, QA and production, but um, across uh, all of these groups together. In fact, it's kind of funny that uh, DevOps is missing a, a representation in the word between the development team and the operations teams. It almost should be. Dev QA ops, and I guess that has too many syllables in it. Um, but it's it's what we're trying to do and bring these groups together. And some of the things, and it's hard to read these. Uh, some of the processes that we have for the uh, connecting the teams, um, having configuration management, so that uh, what the development team is building has a specific configuration for it, and the test team has the same configuration. Uh, release management, having knowing what's in the release and with a uh, consistent bill of materials. 
Um, change management, why was the change even done? Is the change as a result of a bug and it need, might have a different sense of urgency or was it done because of a feature request and was that feature request a minor feature request or, or, a, or a big feature request? And these are also part of the big three is configuration, release, and change management. But the fourth uh, management area is performance management. And performance management has been a, a, an area that tends to get pushed off um, even later in the process to once something gets completed, uh, when it's in production, then we'll do our performance man uh, testing and management, or maybe at the end of QA after we've done our functional tests. Um, our premise is that performance can be uh, tested much earlier in the development cycle, even with every release in a continuous testing, continuous performance, uh, again, putting uh, continuous with it. So these are some of the key processes. It's not just between development and test, but also between um, test and ops that, and, and test and depl the deploy team um, that these processes apply because you need to have the configuration management out to deployment, and release management out to deployment, et cetera, and of course performance uh, management uh, process all the way up to deployment too. So what is it that drives this? Well, one of the major things is the consistence of what is the bill of materials for that. Um, Applying this across the big three, knowing what's what's changing in the, the bill of materials, what's the configuration in the bill of materials, and what's the release bill of materials for this. Um, if you get a box from Amazon delivered to you, and you open it up, and you wonder, is something missing from this box? Well, what do you do? You look at the, the shipping label inside the shipping sheet in front of it, inside of it, and you see, all right, it says there are seven items that are supposed to be in this box, and the, the you count up the items that are inside the box. That's your, your record of, of what it is that's supposed to be in there. And that's what drives the assembly line at, at, um, uh, at uh, Amazon from even which box they should grab and then which items they put into them and in which order. And it's also what can drive um, your DevOps process. And so um, if you think of it like a manufacturing, it's very similar. And um, hopefully we're much farther away from this type of a manufacturing line where uh, uh, all of the cars either are the same color or they're all done with manual processes, um, but uh, we take our process all the way to this where you, you can't really see that all these wonderful yellow robots are doing this uh, assembly line of these cars and there's no humans in the room at all. Everything's been automated and if something goes wrong, the robots will stop the line and send it back. Um, everything moves at the same pace. It's not based on the speed of one uh, human versus another. Um, everything connects together. Uh, some other examples of what happens when things uh, don't run at the same pace. Uh, an example of uh, why is CI so critical. Um, don't have the sound that goes with this, but this is an old uh, I Love Lucy clip. Uh, it's probably getting a little bit dated, uh, being that it's about 50 or 60 years old for this clip. But they, Lucy and uh, Ethel are here between the, in between production, the candy's being made, and delivery, the candy's being delivered out to the customer. So they're kind of a mix of uh, quality and uh, um, packaging. And uh, this is the boss telling them that uh, the, the, the candies are gonna be coming down the line. And this is a great operating model right now. Things are coming out of development at a good speed. QA is keeping up. They're looking very relaxed. Things are going out the door into the production environment and everything is nice. Now they've gone to a mobile environment, and what happens? Well, the demands on, uh, on the, next, uh, the, the next stage down increase. Uh, the builds come at a much faster pace. Uh, they sh really should be stopping the line and, and mentioning that they're not keeping up on quality, but everybody says, well, we've got to ship it every week, or we've got to ship it every two weeks. So what happens with quality? Well, not, the quality's gone down a little bit. It's not being tracked anymore. Some things are not being tested at all, and well, it looks like a few bugs are just being hidden under the table or maybe in their mouths right there. So uh, this is, and, and poor quality. I, I've always felt for quality all my life that they're the ones who, when a schedule is tight, quality and, and also documentation are the ones to suffer. Um, uh, the, look how fast it's going and they're just not keeping up. And the line should have stopped in development. They really should have been part of the dev team and the dev team should be in here helping. But guess what happens? Here comes, it's time to report the metrics to the boss. <laughs> <laughs> How's quality? Well, everything's just fine. <laughs> there are no bugs. There's been no issues at all. We've kept up, and there's the boss. So, and, and, and if you've ever heard the boss is saying, oh, everything's just fine, speed it up. So that's what's... <laughs> so if things can only go as fast as each part on the conveyor belt, 
Um, so you need all of the teams communicating to each other, and this is what's great about Agile teams, is having the test, uh, you know, the QA people often as a member of the same Agile team. Um, you've got total collaboration, and developers who can become quality, and quality people can help with development, um, so that the line keeps moving consistently all the way out. Um, the big three is what will drive this, this cycle and be able to keep it consistent. What you don't want, of course, is just like Lucy and Ethel, or um, like we had with Kathleen Sebelius, well, we, didn't just, we just didn't have enough time to test, is one phrase, or we didn't have time to test this very complicated product. So they shipped the product anyway in, addition, in, in spite of the fact that it had not enough testing associated with it. Um, so there was, this was not a, a well-defined uh, product. And if you know the story of what's happened since then, uh, a bunch of industry experts from um, uh, companies like ours have gone in and, and really uh, cleaned up a bunch of government processes, not just at healthcare.gov, um, but across, and they've become quite a tiger team at fixing big government, and it's been uh, really cool. Um, another thing from the past, not quite as old as uh, I Love Lucy, is this OSI model, which defined a framework for all the different layers of delivery from a physical layer all the way up to an application. Um, and it gives, uh, you might even see some of these, these as, uh, departments in your company, whether, or, or even in your application, you've got presentation layer, you've got the data layer, you've got physical layer down at the, the below the data. Um, and it's one model that can be used for um, looking at your, uh, your, your uh, processes. Um, also, we've got disconnected processes often over here with um, IT operations um, and your development team. Uh, doing testing and working on the big three, but also the IT people, that's where they're worrying about performance and capacity management. And there's a big hole between, which is where we like to come in and say, uh, performance engineering is something that needs to be addressed, and it needs to be addressed both in the application cycle and in the, and in the release cycle. And it's something that uh, and we don't see being taught uh, that much in schools right now. And especially as you have an even much more complex uh, architecture than the OSI model, um, this is the software stack for the, uh, one of our retail customers and their checkout software that they get from a third party. This is uh, on the, uh, the website of um, uh, this company. And um, it's quite, you know, it, when you look at the architecture of what we're building these days, it's, it is very complex. Um, so we do need to have good processes that make sure that all the components go out, have a, and, uh, uh, go out with a uh, you know, good development process, good testing process, good delivery process, and with uh, performance and testing all along the way. And CI is the key, co key component of this performance engineering process. And, um, and as I said, performance engineering is one of those things that does span all the cycles. It is part of uh, development, it is part of testing, it is part of uh, deployment. Again, looking at the, the factory uh, analogy for uh, software, uh, we have an assembly line that is driven by the, the desire for a, a car to be delivered. Uh, it starts with some materials that are going in, and hopefully they're good and they've been qualified. It goes to an assembly line where it's built, and before it gets out of the assembly line, we checked it. Does it actually work as it's designed? Does the car roll? Um, then we'll do some stress testing on it. So we'll test to see, does it work on a rough road? Does it work on uh, a bumpy road with these um, uh, big blocks in it? And does it perform well in extreme circumstances like really bad uh, weather? But what happens when it actually gets to the customer needs to be measured too. And then the feedback from what happens when it works with the customer goes back into the beginning. Um, if the materials rust, it goes back to we need to change the materials. If the wheels fall off, we need to change the way the wheels are attached, etc. So all of these processes together from development and design and, de and QA and delivery and monitoring, mon just because you shipped it doesn't mean you're done. Monitoring and performance is, is obviously a key part of delivering a quality product. Now we take this to software and it's uh, obvious when we're delivering a, a mobile app, we've got the same thing. We've got hopefully before any code leaves development, it's got unit testing applied to it um, to as close to 100% as possible. Every function should have unit testing applied. Um, does it build? Well, it can't go, if it can't build, it obviously has to go back to the developer. Uh, if it does build, now we've got to do functional validation of it. Does it work as designed? Um, and does it uh, perform well when it's under stress? Hopefully your software doesn't, as this truck, this is a truck that's about to tip over because uh, uh, the wind is blowing it and uh, it wasn't packed well. So uh, does your site fall over on uh, major holidays, Valentine's Day? Uh, does your application handle the load and is it reliable and is it scalable to the level that your customers need? An interesting one in, in software is looking at what happens in actual conditions. Uh, 
people are people, and people are not robots. And people don't use software the same way as each other. Some people um, use a retail website one way, some people use a retail website another. Uh, my wife likes to browse for items on a website. I like to go straight to an item and just put it right in my, in my box. If the, comp the developer of their website doesn't test both cases at scale so that they're dealing with people like me and people like my wife, or there's even another type of people, people who put a lot of things in a shopping basket and then they just let them sit there for a while and then later they take some out and they put some others in. Um, if you don't test for all of the ways that humans use your software, um, then you aren't going to be, make sure that your software is going to be reliable when millions of those humans are using your software. Um, so a big part is monitoring what the users of your software are doing with their software, um, and that's really user monitoring. And then you take the insights that you get back from that right back into the beginning and, and uh, into what you're going to develop and change in your code and even how you're going to test it. So we covered uh, uh, the introduction, continuous, and the big three. And the last section of this talk is about doing CI uh, with mobile and performance testing. And this is where we actually look at how we use CI here at, at SOSTA. So in our SOSTA lifecycle, we have our developers who just made a code change. And uh, as soon as they um, uh, check it in, it goes into our system. And uh, Jenkins can start running unit tests on it. We spin up an environment so that, uh, and the environments are defined as code so that we have a consistent environment, whether it's going to be in our lab or in our test environment. Um, and uh, we'll run load tests against our own software using Jenkins. If it has a mobile component, our, software, our company does have mobile software too. We will run some functional tests on real devices that we have in the lab. We also have devices in the cloud. And so we'll do functional tests there. And we'll also do a performance validation. Is the software running at the right speed there? Um, we have performance testing software that we've built that uh, we sell to our customers. And then we will uh, get it up to our users and we'll monitor it and we hope that the monitors can uh, tell us the truth of how the customers are using it. Um, is it meeting, uh, uh, is it working? Uh, did the updates get out? Is, are the, uh, 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 is everything getting out as focus? Um, and we have live monitoring dashboards that will tell us what's the performance of the software like, um, where are the bottlenecks and um, even the path of the customers, how are they using it and all that data uh, is reported back to us so that we can um, figure out what to change in it and see if the software is performing well at baseline or if it's performing uh, better than baseline or worse than baseline. And then we'll have feedback from our users of things to change and, and things we want to do, uh, new tests we want to add to it, uh, bugs that we find uh, even ourselves in production and we'll send that back to development so that we can prioritize features versus bugs and uh, get those in the system. Here's some of the dashboards that we've created in Jenkins. Uh, and um, so here's our, uh, our uh, main project, our olive branch of our product uh, cloud test. Uh, we have three products, uh, cloud test, touch test, and impulse that we build in our system, um, plus some sub-projects off of those. Uh, here we've, we've got the history of all of our builds and the project. Um, here is one build specifically, a branch build of, uh, from a couple of months ago. And uh, we can see the results. If the build doesn't work, um, the results, uh, the environment is packaged up and, and delivered out to, um, uh, out to the back to the team uh, that submitted for this build. And uh, the results are um, available to them as test results here. Um, if it did pass the build, and then the test results are, uh, tests are all run and uh, aggregated together. We can uh, see that we've got some failures here. So we've got uh, non-blue dots. These are red dots, as you can see. Um, and um, the results also are then uh, integrated into Slack. Uh, hopefully some of you are using some great communication tools like Slack. Slack, we found for us, is really great for getting not only our people talking to each other, because it's got great chat features and channels that we can set up. So we've got a bunch of channels that our developers live in. I think we have about 300 and some odd. Um, but it's also great for our systems to talk to our developers. So when the tests fail, uh, we run a script against the test to see which failed, and uh, messages are sent back to the test developers to check that the tests are still valid and, and why the test failed. Um, so 
completely automated process. Uh, the right developers are informed with ats, uh, at messages back to them. Um, they get it on their uh, desktop, and if they have their mobile phone enabled, they get it right back, and they see exactly which test failed with a live link back to um, the test uh, environment so that they can see what the test results were and, and what the test data was for that. Then, then they, they can, can drill, drill down, down into the test, test failures and see line by line what were the ones, uh, how long did they take to execute, uh, what were the failures, and what's the history of them, and um, choose whether to skip them in the future or um, to rerun the tests. Um, we'll bundle up the test uh, results and report them so we see all of the things that uh, passed and which things failed so we can run regression against uh, the tests again. Just uh, the picture's not so great here, but this is our mobile testing lab where we do all of our auto automated uh, mobile on-device testing. Um, this is, a, uh, I find, for a lot of companies and customers, um, a source of pain is um, doing your mobile functional testing. Um, so we can talk about that later. We've got a, a demonstration of this set up in the booth. Um, but we test on multiple devices, some of even more off the picture on another rack. They don't all fit on the shelves here. Um, but every build that we do goes through um, cloud testing, uh, on-premise on, on testing, on-mobile device testing, if it's one of our mobile products. Um, so we've automated it from end to end so that we, it's as touch-free as it can be. Um, if the UI tests fail, we can, um, uh, the, our web UI tests uh, fail, we can see and drill, uh, drill down into the results of our tests. This is our test uh, environment here um, that we built called Cloud Test, and we can see um, step by step where the test failed, any of these that are circled in red is a test failure, and we can drill down into the reason for the failure, whether it's due to an HTTP request or a web UI request or, or what was happening at the time and why it failed, and this is all saved in archive. And then when it all works, we see everything is green, and we see that uh, no, there were no errors here that were passed in a regression test, and we can promote the release uh, out to uh, production. So that's uh, a, a, quick snap, a quick view into what we do in our CI system. We do this across our, our three products. Uh, we do uh, four builds a day of each product, uh, both our dev branch and the customer ready branch. And we execute 8,000 tests on every build. And if the product has a mobile part, we also execute 300 automated tests on iOS and 300 more on, on Android. And like I said, so we do just do this throughout the clock. We don't do a full build and a full test when every developer checks in anything, but on a regular basis at, at uh, 8 a.m., noon, 4 p.m., and 8 p.m., we will do these builds so that, uh, I think there's a later one at night, um, so that the developers will always know what's the status of the build um, and um, will always keep it running. So our path to continuation, continuous um, testing and our takeaways, if you understand your requirements, then you can um, build a system like this where uh, with uh, predefined uh, um, test requir uh, development requirements and testing requirements. Um, for us, um, the cloud was a big advantage for us in both in uh, building in the cloud and testing in the cloud. Um, so there might, you might find the same advantages for you, uh, especially um, with the products like um, Jenkins and now with um, Amazon delivering code pipeline, um, you can do a lot more in the cloud. For automation, uh, we found that the best thing was to automate the obvious tests and the most critical, and that wasn't always the, uh, to automate the hardest tests, because automating the hardest tests, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. But if you automate the easy tests and the ones that people are bored running um, and um, are easily automatable, that gives you time to work on the more complex uh, automation tests. Um, and um, rather than uh, spending, getting no automation done at all. The best time to start automation is, uh, or the best thing to start with automating is the easy thing, and then you can move on to iterate to the harder things. Um, of course, we've all seen the value of having a continuous process and um, uh, having that as just a part of the way you do it. Uh, but also um, having actionable information out of your automated continuous process that then gives your team direction of what to do when something goes wrong. Um, if you then, the, the type of information that's helpful to them is things like uh, we have this output of one of our tools that analyzes all of our end users' behavior on uh, a, one of our retail customers' websites. Uh, you really can't see my icon very well, but this is looking at all the different paths 
to a customer making a purchase on a retail website and you see that some of the paths, uh, if, the, if the user starts in the center, um, some of the paths are a little bit deeper where they put an item in a shopping cart and then check out uh, and do some searches along the way. Um, but some of the paths, in fact, this very, very large path was very, very short. And I mentioned before how um, a lot of customers on retail websites put a bunch of items in a shopping cart, go away for a long period of time and come back. That coming back process is one that's actually very difficult for websites to do because you have to, you, you've put the customer's shopping cart to sleep. You've put everything away in the database and you've saved it for later. And that when that later comes back and the customer says, I want to see all the items that I've put in my shopping cart, um, you want to get them back very quickly. Ends up that for this customer, 30% um, of their customers were doing that on a regular basis, but they weren't load testing this at all. So when the customers came and did it in volume um, on certain days, like when sale prices were announced and they had a bunch of items in their shopping cart and they wanted to see the new prices, their site would go down. Um, so it's only by knowing what the end user's behavior is and analyzing it that you'll see we need a load test for that, and that's about 5%. We need a load test for that, that's about 7%. We need a load test for that, another 7%, etc. And we need a load test for this, and that's about 30%. So um, this is the type of actionable information that goes back to your, your test team and lets them know uh, that this is something that they're going to need to address. Um, some, some final, final takeaways. Take Why is this important? Well, this is important for protecting your company's revenue if you're trying to make money, because having your site go down on Black Friday or any day you're running a sale or any day that you're uh, running a site uh, is important. Uh, it protects your company's brand uh, because uh, you don't want to tarnish your brand by, company, uh, by your customers saying your site is slow, you don't have something that uh, performs well and doesn't deliver what it's supposed to. And of course, that's part of your competitive advantage is knowing what you do better than others. Like for example, uh, Amazon delivering something to your doorstep in a day is uh, setting a high bar and competitive advantage, and they do that by knowing what goes in the box. Uh, and uh, they, you can say they're doing the CI for manufacturing. Um, so that's a, a quick look at CI with inside of uh, Sosta. Um, it looks like I do have, I talked too fast, so I have time for some questions, but let me also point out we are doing demos down below. Uh, we do have free versions of all of our products. I, I did reference all of our products throughout, but uh, we do testing with cloud tests, we do functional testing with touch tests, and we do site monitoring with impulse. Um, you can use the products for free forever, they're not time trials. Um, and we also have a blog where we talk about uh, our uh, views of performance and CI and uh, continuous testing and continuous performance and the value it is for uh, companies like yours and what you're delivering. Uh, so I do have a couple of minutes uh, extra for questions. There could be questions about um, how we do things in Sosco or we just talk about uh, CI in general. Uh, any uh, questions from the audience? Or we can, we can enter. So, actually, actually, I'll be available for questions here, and I invite you to come by our booth. Uh, if you do come by our booth, we are giving away a GoPro, so you can put your card in, in our uh, fishbowl drawing. I uh, appreciate your time and energy and, and attention, and uh, hope to see you in the booth. Thanks very much.